ladies and gentlemen, you've had a, a very rich day of presentations, and uh, when you have a good cake, you always put the uh, the icing on the top, and uh, we're, I think, ending our day in uh, the presentation that will shortly follow, and then our reception with uh, what I think is going to be some very nice icing. We've tried to uh, avoid having too many introducers introducing introducers, but let me take uh, just five seconds to introduce Rita Hauser, president of the Hauser Foundation and chairperson of the International Peace Academy. Rita is an international lawyer whose real passion is foreign policy. And uh, I won't go through a very long list of institutions that she's been involved in other than to note that it, it bridges the the Aspen Institute, uh, the IISS in London, the RAND Corporation, work on various congressional, or uh, sorry, State Department panels uh, that make her eminently qualified for a whole range of internationally oriented activities, not the least of which is to introduce our honored speaker this afternoon. Read it, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. When uh, Dick Solomon called and asked if I would introduce Condi Rice, I accepted with alacrity because it would give me the opportunity to tell you a good bit about her personally, and I leave to her to tell you about her views on foreign policy, as she will this weekend assume the position of National Security Advisor to the new president, the first woman to hold that position. But before I do so, I want to make a very, uh, perhaps astounding confession. Condi and I share a man here in Washington. And we share someone's deep friendship, affection, his wise counsel. He's always there for both of us. And I think we've marked much of our career by it. I hope I don't embarrass him by saying it's our dear friend, Brent Scopa. Now, as I said earlier, Condi will be the first woman to achieve this position, and it's never easy to be a first in anything, particularly the first woman. In an era when there were not many mentors or role models or people to look to for how to behave when you are the first, you have to rely on your own inner resources, of which Condi has an abundance. Intelligence, drive, competitiveness, great determination, and a willingness to do what's necessary to accomplish whatever one sets out to dream about in life. And she certainly will be reaching that apex this weekend. During the course of the campaign, uh, I saw on numerous occasions the deep affection that President-elect Bush had achieved vis-a-vis -vis Condi. They are really not only comrades and colleagues, but buddies and good friends. Condi is a loyal and deep friend, one whose commitments are very personal, and one whose friendship everyone cherishes. She was a very devoted daughter and a very, very deep and affectionate person to those who were close to her during her life. Her accomplishments are known to you publicly. She's an academic of distinction. She served in the first Bush administration under Brent Scowcroft and then went on to become the youngest provost at Stanford. Being very much in the Harvard crowd myself, I always believed it was important to snoop out the opposition. And when I did call around at Stanford, I found that they were clicking because of this new provost who was doing a most effective job in not only administering, but in setting the tone for the university. It is a true honor to have her with us this evening to talk about the new administration's view of foreign policy, and I know you all join me in wishing her the best of luck as she assumes her position this weekend. Kind of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, you've had decades of service uh, to our country, and in the service of international peace and cooperation, and so it is especially wonderful to have you introduce me. I am uh, very much looking forward to uh, joining the fraternity 
of national security advisors. Um, I don't know if they're going to have to change the rules of admission or not, but uh, it is delightful to uh, follow in the footsteps of a great group of people who serve the country selflessly. And uh, I just want to add uh, no, more, no one more selflessly than my former boss, Frank Stokroft, uh, who I expect will still be on the other end of the phone to tell me how to really do the job. I'm also very glad to be here with all of you. I see a lot of friends in the audience, a lot of people uh, whose wise counsel I've had over the years and uh, whose wise counsel I hope I will have over the coming years. And I'm especially glad to participate in a conference that is organized by the United States Institute of Peace. This is clearly one of our country's most successful new public-private partnerships. I'm grateful to the Institute for its uh, work. I'm grateful to its visionary director, Richard Solomon, uh, with whom I've had uh, many, many interesting and important discussions about foreign policy and about Asia in particular. And uh, I'm very grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to speak about passing the baton. Now, that's an image that I particularly like because uh, passing the baton evokes an image of a relay race run by a team. And indeed, I like that image because Sandy Berger and I are teammates in important ways. We may compete against each other uh, when we're in races at home, but I can tell you that uh, when the United States tries to pull together a foreign policy that is good for American interest and I hope good for the world, that we have both had the pleasure of representing Team USA. This is, has been, as most of you know, a very hurried transition uh, for reasons that we all know. But Sandy has done everything possible to make this transition a smooth one. And I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank him because uh, when we get off uh, to a start on Saturday, if we get off to a good start, it will be in large part because Sandy has performed that task so well, and I would like you all to know that. I'm going to try to keep my prepared remarks relatively short because uh, I'd like to leave some time for questions, for dialogue. I think that dialogue is a part of the tradition here at the U.S. Institute for Peace. Uh, but I want to offer some thoughts about the challenges that we face uh, and a little bit about how I think the National Security Council staff and its advisors need to think about those challenges uh, as we face them over the next several years. Now, as you all know, I had the honor of serving in government for the United States at the end of the Cold War. And in 1990, I saw events that I never thought uh, I would behold. I, like most specialists in international politics, went into government uh, expecting to return to Stanford University with a Europe divided, with a Soviet Union intact, with a Germany divided, and with a world that had been pretty static since 1945, largely unchanged. Well, to my great surprise, and indeed uh, my great honor, I had a chance instead to participate in the unraveling of the Cold War, a largely peaceful unraveling of the Cold War that came about because of great statesmanship on all sides, and I really do want to say on all sides, on the side of the United States, of the Europeans, but also on the side of the Soviet Union, statesmanship that saved the world from what could have been a conflagration. It was also a time when values mattered, when values of individual liberty and freedom that had been suppressed in one part of Europe for almost 50 years emerged unscathed because it turns out that they are incredibly powerful values that can, regardless of the circumstances, endure. I remember particularly one moment when uh, I stood in Moscow at the Okhabarskaya Hotel and witnessed the signing of the document that reunified Germany. And it struck me that it was remarkable that it was done really with very little ceremony. Quite unlike uh, the scores of arms control agreements that had uh, been attended by major summits and great fanfare, this moment was taken, take, took place in a hotel in Moscow. 
the only head of state who was there was Soviet President Gorbachev. In some ways, it was as if the world, tired of the Cold War, had finally decided that it should end with a whimper, not a bang. For that, we should be very grateful. But in thinking about that moment, we should not underestimate how remarkable it was. And I want you to know that I do know that you don't have to hear a band playing to signal that one era has ended and another has begun. For the first years of the new era, after leaving the government, I had the privilege of helping to manage one of the world's great educational institutions, Stanford University, parked right in the heart of the Silicon Valley. In fact, Stanford University and the Silicon Valley are symbiotic. This last week, one of, one of the last remaining fathers of the Silicon Valley, Bill Hewlett, died. Bill Hewlett and David Packard built a little company called Hewlett Packard with a $500 loan from the Dean of Engineering at Stanford University, Fred Terman, who somehow believed that these two young graduate students that he had 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 a good idea and that that creativity ought to be rewarded and that they ought to go out and give it a try. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's still the story of not just the Silicon Valley, but the story of Route 128 and of Austin, Texas, and many, many places where knowledge and smart people that come out of the great American universities go on to create whole new realms of knowledge that become whole new areas of the economy. I can tell you that during that time, the subjects that were familiar and of great love to me, Kremlin debates and nuclear throwaways to be two, were displaced by some new topic. Believe me, when you talk about the rivalry of the great powers in the Silicon Valley, they don't mean East and West. They look toward Redmond, Washington. Now, no foreign visitor to my office ever wanted to talk about nuclear throw weight or Kremlin debate during my time as provost. They wanted instead to talk about how to become the Silicon Valley, how to use the creativity and innovativeness of their people to create whole new areas of knowledge and to spur the kind of economic miracle that we have seen in this country. I'm grateful for the opportunity of having had that experience because it taught me something very special about the United States of America. And indeed, unless you understand the specialness of the American experiment, it is hard to understand what America can mean in the world. First of all, it taught me that creativity and openness and risk-taking, the willingness to let a free people and their labor be rewarded, is really the engine of economic growth. It taught me, too, that we are one America out of many backgrounds and ethnic heritages because California and the Silicon Valley in particular is as ethnically diverse a place as you will ever find. And in fact, one of America's great strengths has been that it has been open to wave after wave of immigration constantly rejuvenating, constantly strengthening the pool of people already here. And that is something that if we ever lose, we lose something that is very vital to the United States. 